Hello, and thank you for letting me present FCC's outlook of cattle markets for 2020. Uh, I would have really liked to present this live at the AGM, but we uh, we had a bit of technical difficulties. And so I think the next best option is for me to take this presentation and make it available to your association and membership. So um, we, we live uh, obviously in, in times where um, things have been moving and there's a lot of unknown going forward. So what I want to do is to present to you what we monitor at FCC in terms of the most relevant trends for the red meat markets, as well as most specifically the beef market. Uh, I would like to start off by focusing on what I would call the macroeconomics. There are a few things going on in the world that do have an impact on your bottom line. Obviously, most economies are going through a major slowdown when it comes to economic growth. We can focus on some of the numbers, but the forecasts are a, you know, a dime a dozen right now. I don't think it's uh, what matters really is to focus on the numbers, but mostly focus on the story. Whether we're talking about China, which has a huge weight on the global economy, it's most, uh, also most specifically on the ag markets or ag and food markets, whether we focus on the US, Canada, the entire economy is slowing down during the first six months of the year. And I think the big question mark is what kind of a rebound can we expect going forward? Beef is perhaps the one food commodity or one food product that is the most sensitive to economic conditions. And so I think it's worth, uh, um, it's quite useful to actually focus on what's going on from a macro standpoint. Now, these are forecasts or on the left hand side of the screen. This is a forecast that is a bit dated, about uh, six weeks old. But nevertheless, I think it makes um, the point that I want to make or it serves to illustrate the point that I want to make. If you focus on this particular uh, pattern of economic growth in Canada, um, you do have, if you focus on the blue line, uh, what I would call a V-type recovery, apparently, right? So you got this huge, steep drop in a gross domestic product, and then you have a somewhat of a recovery. But if you were to extend this uh, chart up to the end of 2021, the one thing you would notice is that the blue line would not get back to where we were at the end of 2019. So in other words, this uh, economic recovery, even if we call it a V-type rebound or uh, if it's a U-type rebound, it's going to take time. And likely by the end of 2021, we're not going to be back to where we were at the end of 2019. There's also the possibility as we're seeing this gradual reopening across the country, across North America and across the world, really, that we have a second wave sometime in the fall of this virus. And that could lead to some shutdown of parts of the economy and have uh, what we call a W type economic recovery. I think at this time, I'm fairly confident we can eliminate the possibility of having an L type economic recovery, meaning that, you know, there's a steep drop in, in the economy and then we're not growing for an extended period of time. I think we can rule this out for now, but I think it's also worth pointing out that we have to have realistic expectations as what uh, the recovery is going to look like. And that's going to be into 2021 and 2022 before we have a full recovery. Um, the Bank of Canada has been pretty clear. So if you wonder about interest rates, they're expected to remain low. What you see up on the screen on the far right is a, an average borrowing cost for businesses in Canada. And, and I um, am pointing out basically with this chart that we're, you know, if you focus on the far right of this chart, we're at the almost at the lowest point on record that um, happened actually that we reached in the spring or early summer of 2017. So very aggressive action by the Bank of Canada cut back very aggressively, very rapidly as well, their overnight rate, but also injected a lot of liquidity in the marketplace that has pushed down interest rates. And I would expect interest rates to remain where they are for some time. Um, Obviously, the shutdown of the food service has major implications when it comes to, to what consumers are purchasing when it comes to food. Uh, usually for consumers, we'd spend about 30 cents of their food dollar on the, in the food service, 70 cents on food at home. But uh, with uh, almost a total shutdown of the food service sector, we've seen a lot of, of different behaviors when it comes to food purchases. And so consumers started stocking up. Um, this recession as well that we're in right now has led consumers to be more focused on the basics versus high quality. 
There's also consumer a segment of consumers that are focusing more on locally sourced products, which can be you know which can mean some opportunities for uh, cattle producers. Um, it is unknown at this time as we're reopening the food service. What kind of shift consumers are going to make, and and how much more is that going to shift back some of the that food dollar back towards the food service? But the beef sector is obviously a sector that. Um, has a, a vested interest in seeing that there is a quick, fast and safe rebound in the food service sector because beef consumption would benefit from uh, the reopening of the food service sector. If you focus on the Canadian cattle sector, well, I, of course, the story uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the stories certainly has been the shutdown of temporary shutdown of some of the processing plants. So we do have some of the numbers in terms of Canadian cattle slaughters, as well as you know U.S. weekly beef production. Those numbers are lagging a little bit because of the, the availability of the data. But the bottom line is that processing plants have been able to make up some of what was lost, um, some of it, but have basically been able to reach the level that they've been at prior to uh, the crisis. So I think that's part of the good news in terms of catching up the backlog. I don't think that's that has happened a whole lot. It's just starting to happen and and we're likely to see that continue in the near uh, future. Having said that, you know what this shutdown or these shutdowns have created is this gap between farm prices where you know there was not enough demand for live animals to go through the plants as well as a, an excess demand, so not enough meat being offered at the uh, at the retail level. So you've seen wholesale prices climb, and we've seen farm gate prices come down lower. That had major impact on the profitability of cattle producers. Obviously, it's been it's been difficult. The year 2020 was you know when it started. I think most people would would have been optimistic in terms of the profitability trends that we were seeing in the in the industry. And then we had the COVID-19 crisis hit, and then we've seen the spread between prices that have really um, put some financial stress on, on producers. Um, the, the one thing I'll say as well is that the post-COVID-19 uh, situation within the processing plants is, is also uh, something to monitor going forward. Costs of processing plants have been going up. Uh, social distancing within the plants, compens higher compensation to workers. Uh, you know, so these businesses also dealing with you know uh, uh, availability of workers that was really tight at some points in time, and so all of that has put costs you know, additional costs on the structure of cost structure or raised the cost structure of these businesses, I should say. And that's going to be interested to see how all these costs are going to be passed through the supply chain. Uh, at this time, given the income pressures that consumers are facing, I would argue that it's it's difficult right now to pass on some of these higher costs to consumers. And so can these costs be passed on, absorbed by processors or passed on in terms of lower farm prices? That's going to be something to monitor going forward. So in terms of cattle profitability trends, I did say at the very um, on the previous slide that we've had some margins that have been very tight and negative over the course of the last two years. 2019, I believe, started out and in, in with some optimism, but we've seen margins. If you're looking at the cattle prices, whether it's in the futures market, so the cash price, which is in the northwest uh, corner of the screen, bottom line is as we had margins that that have been negative for a while now. Uh, and if you look at the forecast for margins, that would be the chart on the lower left hand side. So in the southwest corner of the screen and using what futures markets are telling us in terms of the, um, the future pattern or possible future pattern of gross margins for feedlots. What we're saying is that we're below break even uh, if because if especially if you add on the fixed costs of these uh, of of of, of rancher, ranchers and and availability of um, of feed. So uh, overall, you know, it's going to be a tight 2020. We're really going to need to see a strong rebound at the consumer level. Before I address that on the demand side, let's focus on what is going on on the feed side. We got, I would say, really uneven pasture conditions across the country. We've had areas where it's really dry and that is um, 
raising some some questions about the availability of feed. If you look at the Canadian barley balance sheet, we've had barley prices recently move up. I would argue, just given what we know about how we're likely to end the 20 uh, this marketing year with stocks that are a lot higher, twice as high as the previous year because of the really strong 20, uh, 2019 crop. I would argue that most of the price increases that we've seen in the barley market are probably behind us and that we probably reached a somewhat of a ceiling. Um, having said that, let's, let's continue to monitor the pace of, of feed usage um, and, and what kind of inventories are we likely to end in the next marketing year, which will depend on the, 20, on the 2020 crop. Uh, corn is starting to move up in the U.S. slowly but surely. The ethanol market is resuming some sort of normality or you know, resuming activity and production and operations toward normality. It's still 10% below last year in terms of uh, usage, but nevertheless, I think we're seeing a little bit of a rebound, and that explains why corn prices have, star have started to rebound in the United States. I really do think that the civil lining in all of this crisis is really on the consumption side, on the demand side. Our exports have been trailing in 2020, especially if you look at what the 2019 numbers would tell us. And so what we, we just had a week ago, the April numbers. And so that suggests that we're trailing, especially when you look at, you know, comparing 2019 to 2020. I mean, said that, I do believe that as we're rebounding and the pace of the economic rebound is going to be really critical to actually see what kind of demand we have in foreign markets. Um, we still have a gap between the available demand, and, um, oh, sorry, the available supply and demand of red meat and animal proteins in general, mostly driven by the African swine fever outbreak in China. China is still dealing with this issue. And yes, they're re rebuilding their, their hogs, their hog herd, but that's going to take some time and it's not likely to happen overnight. And then I think we're going to be dealing with a very strong demand coming for overseas when it comes to animal protein, especially red meat for all of 2020. So I'm expecting a rebound in the summer months. I would say that on a domestic front, and I really do think that's that's one of the leading um, uh, indicator here on the domestic front. If you look at, there are a number of different things that influence beef consumption, right? The economics uh, obviously matter, the price of beef relative to the price of the competing products, overall disposable income in Canada and so forth. And, you know, you can look at unemployment rate and wages and, and all of these different indicators. But if you put all of these aside, and if you really look at the underlying strength in, the, in, in consumer beef preference, that remains absolutely strong. So that's what we do when we compute our demand index. We look at all the different economic variables that have an impact on beef consumption. We take them out of the equation and that what we left with is the strength or uh, the preference uh, of consumers for beef and all indications right now are that it remains absolutely strong. So yes, there's more competition for beef but I would argue that preferences are still very strong. And so if we're able to minimize the increases in retail prices that consumers have seen lately, um, and as well as see income go up in Canada, I do think that there is going to be a, a strong domestic demand. And I, I would argue the same out of the United States. It really matters in terms of the pace at which we're going to be rebounding. And if there's not a second wave, I am fairly optimistic by the end of the year, we're going to see, or if, but even before the end of the year, we're going to see a positive impact from the strength and demand that will be coming back online. Obviously, there are a number of different things as well that need to happen. We need the economy to reopen and hence, you know, you see a traffic on highways. We, um, the United States and China have a big trade deal to work through. There are a lot of issues between the two countries. Hey, there are also a lot of issues between Canada and China that are going to be sorted out throughout the year. So keep an eye on that because obviously any type of disruptions could actually impact trade flows between Canada, China or the US and China. Food service sector reopening is really a good news. And plants have made it a lot of efforts and have worked really hard to keep the plants open or processing businesses have kept really, or worked really hard to keep their plants open. 
And I think that's, you know, as we're resuming some sort of normal normality in terms of uh, the number of animals that are getting processed and getting through the plants, I do think, again, that we're looking at a rebound. But that could be until, um, you know, until summer and maybe a little bit later in the year. I am um, fairly um, optimistic that once we get through this crisis, um, there, there is a positive uh, at the end of this crisis. We got strength and demand. We got a product, you know, when it comes to beef that consumers want. But there's no denying that, you know, this crisis has brought in quite a bit of financial stress on a lot of different operations. And so for more information, I would um, direct you to our website at FCC.ca, where you can find a number of different things when it comes to information about the markets, as well as FCC's response uh, during uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you.